Hi gorgeous, this is episode number 277 and we have the amazing Rock Thomas back on the show today. Hi, this is Rock Thomas and you are listening to Heart Sales Podcast with Christine Schlonsky. Enjoy. Well, I am so looking forward to this conversation. After the first conversation, I could not wait to get Rock back on the show. And today will be about fast growth through seeking feedback. And that might be something that could be pretty scary for one or the other. I for sure know that sometimes I am not always open to feedback. And that also depends on the way the feedback is delivered. So if that feels familiar, this episode is definitely for you. Tune in. Rock Thomas is the world's number one whole life success expert. He is a best-selling author and the host of the I Am Movement podcast. From farm boy to real estate and business guru, mentor and self-made millionaire, Rock has studied one-on-one -on -one with the world's best teachers like Tony Robbins, Stephen Covey, Gary Keller, and many more. And on his mission to inspire others to create their best life on their terms. After decades learning from the greatest minds on the planet, working with and coaching thousands of people in his workshops and webinars, Rock has impacted over 100 million lives with his teachings. His gold cast video alone was viewed by over 100 million people. Now he spends his time teaching people how to be financially free and truly happy on their terms, whether they work for themselves or others. Rock is also the founder of the I Am Movement and he is known as the man who redefines lives. So let's go deeper on today's topic. Well, I am so super excited to have you back on the show, Rock. Welcome. It feels like forever. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? I loved our first episode because, you know, you have changed so much from that little boy growing up with so many sisters and mostly brothers, right? Being chased, being teased to one of the most successful people on this planet. And you are confident, you show up, you make a huge impact in other people's lives because you have walked the path. And from what I, what I also learned is you obviously didn't figure that out all by yourself. So I would love to talk about confidence, about shifting into the person you want to become with the help of mentors or coaches or like, like a support system. Where did you get started and what can you teach our listeners where they can get started in case they feel they are stuck in their mindset and their money blueprint and they just seem not to make any momentum? Yeah, I, I think that it might be the most important thing. I always feel like that when I talk about a point, but who you spend time with. Just think about if, if you're in a relationship with somebody, how much impact that person has on you. You know, um, my girlfriend's a vegan and I've become a vegan now and it's had a massive impact on me. And I've lost a lot of visceral fat. I feel better. My diet's changed. I'm eating in a way that I didn't think was possible. I consume a lot less food than is necessary. My taste buds have changed, like radical change. And I consider myself a very curious, open person when it comes to that. And there was still changes due to proximity. Proximity is power. Mm. We want to connect as humans. We love to connect some of the greatest feelings we get when we're together with other people and feeling like we're in alignment. So if you're around other people that have low standards or eat poorly, think poorly, have not a lot of desire to live a great epic life, you're going to be affected. Even if you're the strongest person in the world, you can, you're still going to have to manage that energy. You go out and have a salad and the person besides you is eating a steak and a Pepsi and a Big Mac and they're, they're telling you, you know, how come you're eating that stuff? You're not going to survive. You've got to manage all that energy. So, so I've met different mentors along the way. My first was when I was in my early 20s. I was very shy and he was a very, very gregarious, spoke five languages. And I learned a lot about meeting and greeting people and body language from him that made me feel much more confident in dealing with people. It was my very first. 
And about seven years later, I met the gentleman who helped me become a very good salesperson. And each time, I became a very willing student, kind of blindly having faith and listening to what they said and doing what they said. Both times it worked out really well. I went from the worst salesperson to the best salesperson, then bought the company and went on to become a multimillionaire. And after four years of paying him off his balance of sale, I took him out to dinner and celebrated because I was so grateful and still remain grateful today that he saw in me some potential and was willing to nourish that. Your mentors should see the best in you and be willing to give you and pour into you. Now, that being said, how do you find a mentor? Well, you got to go to places where people are grabbing life big, people are thinking big, people are, are speaking or training, or they're in groups of people that want to grow. And what I did was I would just go up to people on stage and kind of say, hey, how do I hang out with you? I did that with Tony Robbins. He said, well, you write me a check for $100,000, you can follow me around for a while. And I'm like, okay. And I did it. But it really served me at a great level. You know, I've worked out with him in his gym in Fiji, for example. I've traveled to Italy with him and uh, gone to seeing, you know, some of the great, um, you know, Leaning Tower of Pisa and different things with him and, and had those magic moments. You can also just get a book from a mentor and embody what they're saying. You can have mentors that are dead. And imagine, you know, how would Nelson Mandela handle this? Or how would Gandhi handle this? One of the things that I, I have a new puppy. And so I've been following Caesar, the dog whisperer. And one of the terms he keeps on saying is that leaders are calm and assertive. And I thought, that's a good thing to add to my identity as a leader. I'm always looking for words to add so that they create the guardrails of my success. So he's a mentor of mine. Yeah. They, they don't have to be a mentor somebody. of mine too. <laughs> yes, right? And he's so cool and he's so yeah. confident. He's so experienced. So, you know, students that learn quickly, it's because they're paying attention to the details. And I watch him, I watch how he walks, I watch how he holds his body. And what's interesting is in one of the videos he was coaching, he told the lady, your posture looks nervous and stressed. Stand up straight, mm -hmm. relax your body. And now the dog's gonna feel that. So one of my leadership you know, pieces is all around physiology, the physiology of a winner, right? You can tell the difference with somebody who's confident, who lacks confidence in how they carry their body they're, how they're the tightness in their face. Uh, are they relaxed? Are they, do they feel like they, even if they don't know a way, they know they can find a way. So yeah, you know, I have tons of mentors. I have tons of coaches all the time. I, I have a golf coach, a swimming coach, a piano coach. I have a, several dog coaches right now or mentors or guides or helpers. So I guess the biggest thing is if you can get yourself to be somebody that loves feedback, like seek feedback with absolute hunger. Does a child seek feedback? They're building Lego, mommy, mommy, this piece doesn't fit. What do I do? How come it doesn't fit? And you're like, we'll try it this way. We'll try it this way. No, the other way. That way? Yeah. Oh, look, yay. <laughs> child is constantly seeking feedback and doesn't take it personally, right? And then we become these growing bitter adults and we're figure like we're supposed to know the path. No. I say, I say there's two things you need to be successful, a great work ethic and to be passionately curious. Mm. And if you're passionately curious, you're constantly open to feedback. And that's how I run all my businesses, always asking my clients, how are we doing? What else can we do? How can we grow? How can we make it better for you? What experience is excellent? What one do we need to cut out? And I've learned not to take it personally. How? Read the Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And then reread it and reread it and reread it because it's not the book you read, it's the book you reread. There's so many beautiful principles that will allow you to succeed. But surrounding yourself with great people is probably one of the most important. And then learning to take massive action and get feedback would be up there on the top of my list as well. Yeah. And that also touches the piece of making offers, inviting people to buy your amazing services and products and not giving up with the first no, but get some feedback. Why is it a no? For me, no means not now, 
right? Yes. That doesn't mean when I come back in a month or a year or three years or five or whatever, that it's still a no, right? Cultivating those relationships and just being there and coming from the place of service will enable you to make or be more successful than the average person who takes a no and then, you know, sits on the couch and cries. Yeah, sitting on the couch and crying is is not going to do a lot. But I, I have another phrase for your people that may have heard before is the fortunes in the follow up. Yes. And what happens is that, you know, if you're in sales, you're trying to get a lead, you get a lead, and now you need to qualify that lead. And you qualify that lead by offering or asking questions and de determine whether your service is something they need. Now, they may not need it today, but they may need it in two or three months or two or three years. And depending on the life cycle of your sales process, you now take that lead and you put them into your database and you have a prospect. And then you drip on that person. And the fortune is in the follow-up because the more people you have in your data bank, not your database, because it is your bank, right? Yeah. If you don't have a database, you don't have a data bank. You got nothing. You have no business. So create your data bank and then drip on it, uh, use technology to automate it, then pop in there personally from time to time. And then that person may not need your business today, but you build up trust over time by being consistent. And the person will buy from you in three to six to nine months. If you have a vision for what you're doing and if you're motivated and if you know, you're hungry to succeed. But a lot of people, what they do is they go, oh, they don't want to buy now. And then they have no data bank and they have to start every day from nothing. It is very scary to be an entrepreneur with no data bank. Yeah. So what advice could you give people to get started, no matter if they are in multi-level marketing or if they are a coach, a healer, a creative, like what can they do today to get started and get the momentum? Well, I, I say they should have a really great morning routine. Of course, we know that the Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod or Tony Robbins Power of Hour, do some priming, do something. You've got to get, you know, the, the morning is the childhood of your day. And if you have a rough childhood, you're going to have a traumatic life. If you have a rough morning, you're going to have a traumatic day. So get your morning right, first of all. And then I would say that, you know, Tim Ferriss says, get two quality appointments before nine o'clock in the morning. Do the difficult part first. Prospect right away, call out, reach out, et cetera, et cetera, and plant those seeds. And if you did that every day, you, you, before nine o'clock, your goal is to get two quality appointments, get 10 a week, you'd probably have a business worth owning. And then if you're not willing to do that, listen to the inner narrative of why you're not. And you probably need an ecosystem of accountability. Years ago, after being a trainer for Tony Robbins for 15 years, I realized people came to those events, left, two years of, year, later they came back and they weren't that much better. And I started to ask myself why. And the simple reason is that they didn't have an ecosystem when they came home that held them accountable. And let's face it, if you've ever been to a really cool event like Tony or anything like that, you walk on fire, you come home, you think that the world is going to change with you. But the reality is, is you put on a pair of lenses when you were at that event that said everything's possible and all these people believe it's possible and the energy changed and you all hugged each other and had a great time. Now you go home and people are still in their world. It's like taking a fish out of a dirty fish tank and putting it in a clean fish tank, going to an event and you feel great and you just walk around and the dirt comes off of you because people are smiling and high-fiving you. But then you go home and you take the fish and you go back in the dirty fish tank and now you're trying to stay clean. There's all these negative people around you. So you need to find an ecosystem. So I couldn't find one, I created one. And now my mastermind group has, has thousands of people around the world and people that support, encourage and challenge you to success. We're not allowed to be critical or negative or pessimistic or blame or poo-hoo your plan. We ask quality questions. Oh, so your goal is to start a podcast. Tell me what your strategy is. Who's coaching you? How are you doing that? Oh, you're going to write a book. Tell me more. Do you know John who wrote three books recently? Right? So we help each other succeed. I'd say that, you know, have a good morning routine. Surround yourself with great people and take affirmative action and be willing to do what's difficult first thing in the morning. And if you're not, then you need to get some coaching. You need to get, you know, you need to get a checkup from the neck up. Yeah. Awesome. 
So what does hard sells mean for you? It means you're unprepared. There's no hard sales. There's asking quality questions. I don't even consider myself a salesperson. I consider myself more of a consultant or something. So if I was going to sell you something, Christine, I would ask you questions. So tell me what you want. What's important to you? You know, are you looking to get into better shape? Are you looking to make more money? Do you want more time off? Hey, I have this amazing Sunday system for success time management system that helps people save five to 10 hours a week by being focused. And I merged Tony Robbins, um, Gary Keller's and Stephen Covey systems together. And I think it kicks ass when it comes to that. Would saving five to 10 hours a week make a difference in your life, Christine? For sure. Awesome. So would you like to try it? I'll let you try it for free. And if it doesn't save you five to 10 hours a week, then you can just throw it back and you won't have to pay the 297. But I promise you, I have so many testimonials of people that's transformed them life. And it's not that it's complicated. It's that we identify the things that people think are limiting. Like a lot of people won't set a schedule because they think it takes freedom away. Mm. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk about that because um, I learned that um, structure gives freedom and that was very against what I thought at the beginning. So it really changed and shifted my mindset. Um, let, let's talk about this because people set off to become entrepreneurs so they have freedom and then it's really difficult for them to put themselves in a structure. So what, what is there to do? There's so many beautiful things in that and they would learn it all in that product. Like Parkinson's law, give somebody three hours to do something, they'll take three hours. Give them an hour, they'll take an hour. So people work nine to five, but their productivity is three hours of productivity studies show. is because they stand around, drink coffee, surf social media, blah, blah, blah. Day before you go on holidays, you're much more productive because there's consequences. So we know that we can all do better but until you are really committed to live an outstanding, excellent life, you're going to fall to the cesspool of mediocrity around you. So we look at why do people not get better at time management? And every time I look at changing somebody's behavior, I don't just give them the principle because managing and time blocking is not a new concept, right? Saying for the first two hours, you're going to do your sales calls. After that, you'll do an hour of answering emails and doing some follow-up, then you'll have lunch and then you'll exercise, whatever. That's nothing new, but people don't do it because there's a belief, a conclusion they came up to that works against the principle. So when I work with people, I go beneath the surface and I find what's the, print, what's the belief, and there's several beliefs that we talk about in the time management system, otherwise people don't change, right? So one of them is that people that are high eyes, if you know the DISC model, if you know a personality, because it's really good to understand people's behavior, is that these people tend to like freedom. They value being butterflies. They value being, well, I'm not in the mood. I'm not gonna put three classes of yoga at four o'clock in the afternoon. I may not feel like doing yoga on Wednesday. Then I'm gonna feel guilty that I didn't do it, beat myself up, and we feel yucky. So I'm not doing that, because they tried it, right? So what we do is we, with people like that, we say, okay, what's your outcome for the week? Be healthy and vital. Great. What would you like to do? Three times yoga would be perfect. Great. You have three yoga blocks. Put them in temporary position. And if you don't feel like it, move it around. You get to do that. And it gives them a sense of freedom. And it gives them a sense of empowerment. And just taking away the notion of failure for them relieves them and allows them to execute at a higher level. And then of course, we audit ourselves at the end of the week by having powerful questions. What did I do well? What did I mess up on? How did I succeed? Where did I serve, et cetera? And they go, God, that really worked well. I really prefer the yoga first thing in the morning. Get out of the way, I feel great. I'm gonna shift them now and do them in the morning. So you get 1% better a week. And so when you allow people to identify what their behavior is based on their personality or the conclusions they came to in the past and you give them an empowering alternative, they start to get excited about being more a more resourceful person. People want to win. Kids want boundaries, dogs want boundaries, and so do adults. So give them guidelines within their personality and their behavioral type, and you empower people versus disempower them. Yeah. You just said, well, it's one, you know, if, if it's one percent improvement a week. So I can just hear the listener thinking, like, one percent, that's not a lot. 
but I know there's much more to it. So why is 1% a week? So yeah, great question. So first of all, 1% puts you on the path of progress. And what is the path of progress? Path of progress feels good. People like to improve. If you make a little bit more money, you lose a little bit of weight, you improve your tennis stroke a little bit better, you beat that person you could never beat, just on one shot, down the line, you feel better. So you, you want to put yourself into a path of progress because it changes the way you feel about yourself. And when you feel better, you tend to take more action. If you don't exercise, for instance, I say to people, walk from your house to the end of the driveway and back. Give me one minute. That's it. One minute tomorrow. That's all I want. That's it. Because to tell them you got to work out for an hour seems like climbing Mount Everest. So they won't do it. They think of all the things. Remember, the beliefs show up. I'm going to sweat. I don't know how to work out. I got to get my gym bag. I got to get a parking spot. Ah, they're out. So just give them one minute. And the next day you say, you know what? You could do the same thing. But if you feel like it, do it twice. And once you get in momentum, they're like, I could do it twice. It's not that bad. They do it twice. Before you know it, 30 days later, they're doing a 30-minute walk around the block with their loved one or with their dog. And they're like, man, I feel great. 1% better. 1% better is a philosophy of compound, right? You stack it, you stack it, you stack it. Make one call to a new client tomorrow. The next day, make two, then three. It's not that complicated. The compound stacking effect becomes monumental. If you haven't heard of doubling a penny for, I think it's 31 days in a row, how much money will you have? It's over a million dollars by just doubling a penny. People don't understand that little, like the extraordinary person is the ordinary person doing small things consistently. That's it. So, so beautiful. So can we talk about stacking positive experiences? Like stacking, calling a client or potential client, having an amazing call. Maybe even the person says yes and we all of a sudden have a new client on board. And how can we stack these uh, positive feelings so that a negative experience doesn't, you know, cancel all the positive stuff? So that's a really good insight because I've done a lot of studying around that. And our mind, because it wants us to survive, sorts negative experiences on your desktop. So you open up your mind in the morning and you open up your phone and you start to react to the world. Not a good strategy, by the way. But generally, if you, let's say you drink coffee every morning and one day you spill the coffee on yourself and you've had hundreds of times when you didn't, but you did this one, your brain will sort that behavior to the top where you were trying to carry clothing in your right arm and then pour the coffee with your left that you don't normally do and then it's built on your leg. Your brain goes, don't ever do that again. Right. And the yep. way it makes sure that you're not going to kill yourself is by bringing it right up to the desktop and sorting it right there. So you wake up in the morning, you head toward the coffee. And what happens? Your brain goes, don't ever do that again. And you're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. Serves you. But what happens to people that don't shuffle the deck properly is that all the negative experiences of their life, that one person that told them that their hair looks yucky, the one person says that you, you know, you look like four eyes with those glasses on. They don't remember the five people that told them you look smart and educated with those glasses on. It makes you look really dignified. They don't remember that because they're shuffled to the bottom of the deck. So personal development, in my opinion, is about reshuffling the deck and bringing those positive experiences through gratitude practices, through what we call emotional floods, saying I'm gifted, guided, grateful, powerful, passionate, playful, sexy, sensual, sensitive, and blessed. Yes. That's who I am. At my best, I am gifted with an elite athletic body and ability to serve people at the highest possible level. And I'm guided in such a beautiful way by the resources around me to do the right thing and learn from everything and be grateful for everything, right? It's raining today. I'm going to go play in the rain. So there's ways that you can now shuffle the deck with the files in your mind so that they, they, they're there to serve you. You don't want to pour coffee you know, and, and on yourself every day. So you need them there, but you don't need them to be guiding you and making you fearful every day. So the, a lot of the work that I do is to help people to understand 
the amygdala, the part of your brain that keeps you alive, works really, really efficiently, but you need to sometimes give it time off. Sitting on the couch watching TV is not a time that you need to imagine tomorrow you're going to be doing terrible in your presentation. That's not going to serve you. Yeah. If you want to, go in, take, take a corner of your office, put a piece of tape around it, two by two, and you get to stand in that box and you can get all your fear and doubt and worry out in that box. Oh my God, I might dumb, I might do terrible, I might flood my words, I might sweat. Uh, get it all out. Then step out of that box and be grateful that you're fully alive and you get to have this experience card do a presentation tomorrow and you're going to knock it out of the park like a badass that you are. Awesome. And I would just encourage people to do that with all the emotions they have around sales, feeling they want to run away, uh, they might stammer on their words, they feel their stomach turning. So just put that in the box. What a great tool. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. So I, I don't think I was asking it in the right way earlier. So I'm just going to ask it again. And um, that might be my German accent as well. What means heart cells for you okay <laughs> got you got you yes um you know i think that i have a saying is nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care mm. and for me it's back to that passionate curiosity it's stephen covey seek first to understand before being understood i had a client of mine that, well, client, a friend that I met at a Tony Robbins event. And he just joined my mastermind after seven years. And for seven years, he was selling product online, running a CrossFit organization. And a year ago, he went bankrupt. Young man, early 30s, married kids. And in my opinion, he resisted being part of an ecosystem for various reasons. He wanted to do it on his own. He had his better way. He didn't want people to realize he wasn't doing it well. And he eventually joined because he realized that he had hit this rock bottom. But heart sales to me was for seven years, I really liked this young man. He was a man of character. I worked out with him. He was hard charging Filipino man. Um, he his voice would be in my head when I did pull-ups because I just am not generally great at pull-ups. And he is like five foot four and 100 pounds and he did like a million of them. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's a cool vision for me to have one day. But I felt like I wanted to, like a father almost, bring him into my world and help him because I saw that he had these blind spots. So for me, heart sales is caring, really caring about the person mm. and is my product or service going to serve them and then relentlessly showing up. I probably touched base and reached out to him as a friend, congratulated him on his wedding, the birth of his child, happy birthday. Hey, when are you going to come join our tribe? Blah, blah, blah. Probably 50 times over, you know, seven years. And we're not like close, close friends. We're acquaintances. So to me, I never feel fear around selling at all. I love to sell because to me, it's a pursuit of seeking to understand whether my product or service makes you better. And if it doesn't, I may ask you to leave my tribe. I may ask you to give my product back because it doesn't serve you. Yeah. Does that make sense? To yeah, totally. I always talk about the soulmate client. Like if you don't feel you can serve them, send them somewhere else. Yeah, and right. I do. Don't take that business. Like, make sure you understand what they truly need, and then you make the decision together if you want to work together. And if it's a no, because you feel like there are red flags showing up and they are not a perfect match for what you offer, you send them somewhere else or give them a resource or the education they need so they are ready to start working with you. I think what happens is that people are have a client in front of them and they are fearful that they're going to lose that client or there's not enough clients or that they're going to have to start over and talk to somebody else. So they try to convince a client that doesn't really need their product. And that's where the discomfort comes in. Selling somebody a house or trying to convince them now's the time to sell when they don't really want to sell. Their wife's one month pregnant. They could live in that house for another two years, but it would be a stretch. 
That's your agenda, not their agenda. Mm. When yeah. you clarify their agenda and what serves them at the highest level, then you can now work together to find that product or service. And if it doesn't happen to be, like you said, Christina, uh, in your arsenal of products, then refer them somewhere else. How many people I've sent to a Tony Robbins event, a Landmark event, a T. Harv Eker event, referred The Way of the Superior Man by David Data when it comes to masculine energy, thousands of books. I mean, I love, I love to promote, actually. If you're around me, I will probably recommend something to you all the time about something. Yeah, because you believe in me. Right? That's when we, when we see the potential of someone else and we know something that helps them to get to their goals or become that better person they dream of. Obviously, we promote. I think that's, that's, an, that's a natural process. <laughs> it's 100%, but I think it's also developing confidence in yourself and the growth process. Sadly, a lot of people have stopped really being in love with growing. Mm. They're hoping that things get easier. Well, it's uncomfortable growing. It is uncomfortable until you get addicted to that 1%. Yes. Until you realize that the juice of life, the rise of Superman, written by Stephen Kotler, talks about this zone 1% to 4% outside your comfort zone where the learning is at its maximum. If I take somebody and I put a parachute on their back and I throw them out of a plane, they're not going to learn nothing. They're going to be pure survival mode. The adrenaline is going to go through the roof and they will not be able to capture the learnings. So what we do is we put people into that zone that's just outside of their comfort on a regular basis and in an environment where they can get feedback and then they can process it. And that's how people grow. But they're also mostly alive. Yeah. Awesome. And it's sad to see people that haven't yet understood that because they sit on the couch, they're trying to avoid anything new. They say no to things that could be fun. Hey, do you want to go jump in the pool? No, what's the temperature of the pool? I don't have any clothes. I was at a party the other day. You know, we all jumped in our underwear. It's like that's because the it was a really group of successful people. Probably half the group did. Just because we can. Yeah. No other reason. Just because you just can. to be silly and young and light and free and capable. And you worry about if there's enough towels to go around later, you drip dry or whatever. You put your pants back on and so you got a wet ass. Who cares? It's a story. You're alive. But <laughs> like, you know, I want to be around people that say yes to life. Yeah, that enjoy life. And you <laughs> brought us an amazing ebook that people can get at rockthomas.com. And obviously the links will be in the show notes as well. Tell us about what they will learn. Yeah, so this, this thing about the words that follow, I am, follow you. It's so powerful how you describe yourself. I am a procrastinator. I am funny. I am sweet, loving, great, generous, stupid. Um, most of them are unconscious. So when I learned that and I changed my identity from this little boy with acne pizza face to more like Clint Eastwood, ruggedly handsome, I had this metamorphosis on how I, my confidence grew. And I, so I tell the story and the steps on how you can take any of your, what I call your pizza faces, your, I'm a loser, I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm too stupid, I, I'm dyslexic, I'm ADD, whatever it is. Take your unresourceful label, walk it through the book, and come out empowered so that you can be the best version of yourself. And I think there's nothing at the core more important than doing that process. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for, again, an amazing episode. So many golden nuggets that you dropped, and I hope people go back and listen more than once and take notes. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, your love with our listeners today and have an amazing day. Yeah, cheers. I so love these two episodes with Rock. I think they are so inspiring and so important to really shape your life, to redefine your life, to create a life of your dreams by following along with some of these steps that Rock shared. 
Hop on over to christineschlansky.com and make sure you are downloading your free gift, Rock's ebook, The Power of Your Identity. The link for you is right there. Obviously, you can also get it on Amazon and pay for it. Or you can come to christineschlonsky.com forward slash podcast and check out Rock's episodes number 276 and 277 and get your book in the resource section. And once you're over there, connect with Rock. All his links are just one click away. And I'm so grateful for the wonderful work he does, how he empowers people and what people can learn from him by his amazing story, by being inspired. So if you are looking forward to collapsing time by learning from somebody who's been there, who's done that, who definitely got a couple t-shirts, then you're right with rock so check him out and thank you so much for tuning in i hope you are tuning in to the next episode and till then i am wishing you a wonderful day wherever you are in this beautiful world and i'm saying bye for now